Hello, my name is Nicola McEwen. I'm Professor of Territorial Politics at the University of Edinburgh and Co-Director of the Centre on Constitutional Change. And I've been asked to make a contribution to the panel exploring how the European Union might become more engaged in sovereignty disputes within member states. Now, certainly to date, the EU has appeared ill-equipped or perhaps unwilling to engage in such disputes, preferring instead to see these as internal matters for the member states and only internal matters for the member states. Now, there is a debate about whether or not the EU ought to get more involved. I know that's the subject of another panel at the conference here. And certainly the treaty provisions within Article 4.2, by emphasising the respect for the territorial integrity of states, by emphasising respect for the national identities and constitutional structure, does discourage meaningful intervention. It may even indeed provide some legal constraints on the opportunities available to the EU to intervene in such disputes. But I think we can um, accept that there are enough provisions elsewhere in the treaties to give us confidence that a more meaningful role can be developed. What then practically could the EU do? In my paper, I offer five steps or five suggestions for consideration of developing a more meaningful role. The first of these involves recognition. Recognition that sovereignty disputes are, yes, internal matters of member states, but that they're also internal matters for the European Union as a whole. The EU is a multi-level polity. It involves not just horizontal relations between member states enjoying equal legal status, but it also in involves vertical relations between nested polities, including those sub-state territories and institutions that are involved in sovereignty disputes and that have a recognised role within the EU polity. The fate of sovereignty disputes also affects EU interests directly, including the rights and the well-being and the future of EU citizens who live in the disputed territory, including the free movement within and across that territory, perhaps even the health of the European economy, perhaps even the, the peace and stability in Europe. And all of that presents the EU with a legitimate opportunity to engage more directly and arguably the responsibility to engage but recognition of that responsibility is the first step. The second step, I would suggest, is understanding. Part of the EU's engagement with sovereignty disputes ought to involve an effort to understand them. Viewed from Brussels or from the comfort of a national capital with authority over large areas of public policy and a voice on those policy decisions where authority is shared, the centrifugal ambitions of sub-state nationalists can appear to be in violation of the integration and the reconciliation that underpins the European dream. From that perspective, secession leads to fragmentation and fragmentation is the antithesis of integration. Now that's quite a prevalent view within the EU institutions, I would suggest, and perhaps even in capitals around the European Union, but it betrays a lack of understanding of the dynamics that drive demands for self-government. In general, in the most prominent cases at least, these are less about nativist identity-driven desires to separate the territory from its neighbours and more about a desire for gaining policy autonomy and influence over the decisions that affect them. Increasing understanding could be generated by supporting a programme of research, for example, to identify the grievances and the ambitions of the sub-state territories, the concerns and the fears of the wider population, and the implications of alternative scenarios and outcomes for the disputed territory, for the member state, and for the union as a whole. And such research could also inform any decision-making process that may be initiated as part of the process of territorial management in an attempt to accommodate the territories and to resolve the disputes. The third step is procedural clarification. 
Without clarification of the procedures by which the seceding territories would renegotiate their relationship with the European Union, we're left with the claim and the counterclaim of protagonists in, to the sovereignty dispute. Now, there's no way of ever getting away from claim and counterclaim by politicians, but a clearer framework could help to evaluate these claims and to inform the choices facing citizens in sovereignty-laden electoral and referendum contests. The official response, which is only ever offered to a hypothetical case of secession from a member state, is that on independence, the EU treaties would cease to apply to the newly independent state, although it would be free to renegotiate entry as an applicant country to membership of the European Union, so long as it respected the EU's core principles. But that doesn't really tell us very much about the specific cases. What if there is no successor state to inherit EU membership? That might be the case, for example, were Belgium to ever get that far in a sovereignty dispute. Would both of those territories in Belgium be then obliged to apply for EU membership? Or in the case of a newly independent country that does have to accede to the EU, could its succession be fast-tracked or would it have to join a long line, a long queue? Would it require adoption of the, the acquis in full from the outset or would there be a realistic expectation of some derogations, for example, from the currency or from Schengen or a gradual process towards meeting these obligations? And what would it mean for the rights of EU citizens and businesses that had already taken advantage of free movement if the treaties were to cease to apply without any prior negotiation. Now, the Brexit process has revealed the complexity involved in extricating a territory from the European Union. It's been complex enough. Imagine how much more difficult it might have been without an Article 50 process to guide those negotiations. And just as the existence of Article 50 had absolutely no bearing on the decision of EU electors to leave the EU in 2016, experimental evidence suggests that treaty clarification would have only a limited impact on public decision-making over sovereignty processes within member states. In an ideal world, procedural clarification would include an addition to the treaties to guide the European dimension of a secession process and the future relationship of a seceding territory vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. And if you will indulge me a little more in my ideal world scenario, this might sit alongside or be embedded within the treaty provisions on amendment in Article 48 or on, or on accession in Article 49 or on withdrawal in Article 50. However, of course, we do not live in my ideal theoretical world and political interests and live sovereignty disputes make treaty change of this kind extremely unlikely. But even so, there could be a more open perspective on the variations in accession processes and the flexibilities that the European Union has already demonstrated in response to the particular circumstances of applicant countries as well as the constraints upon such flexibilities. This would provide at least some insight and perhaps provide a firmer foundation for the EU's neutrality than the current holding line. That leads to the fourth step, and that's mediation or soft intervention. Any intervention by EU authorities in sovereignty disputes is likely to underline the importance of operating within the rule of law. The EU response to the Catalan referendum in 2017 focused on condemning the illegality of the vote with little reference to the heavy-handed response of the Spanish authorities. Now, notwithstanding the contested interpretations of the Spanish constitution, it's reasonable to conclude that the constitutional order of Spain would prohibit secession under any circumstances, even in the face of an as yet hypothetical overwhelming demand from Catalonia or another stateless nation within Spain. 
the likelihood for such a scenario to create instability and mounting tension within the borders of an EU member state, with potential spillover and wider repercussions in other parts of the Union, would make the internal matter stance of the European Commission appear like a dereliction of duty. It's not for the EU to give instructions to either party in a sovereignty dispute, nor is it in the interests of its neutrality to pick a side. But it could play a part in helping to avoid escalation, for example, through offering to facilitate dialogue between parties to the, to the dispute or by supporting initiatives that specialise in conflict resolution. The EU has had a role in supporting peace and reconciliation in other disputed territories. Its interventions in Northern Ireland, for example, have helped to Europeanise the peace process through peace programme funding, through support for civil society organisations to engage in cross-border cooperation, and by providing an overarching framework within which to embed and partially depoliticise conflicting territorial identities. Now, there is a concern, of course, that Brexit risks some of those achievements, but it does illustrate what can be done, even in the most disputed territories. The final step is accommodation. The European Union has overtly, at least, refrained from developing strategies of territorial management and accommodation that we often see in nation states faced with having to respond to sovereignty claims. But the EU may have inadvertently encouraged these claims. The promise of a new kind of political community in which sovereignty is shared um, and pooled together offers the potential to reduce some of the costs and the risks associated with secession. The opportunities open to small states within EU decision-making institutions, 10 of which are smaller than Scotland, 13 of which are smaller than Catalonia or Flanders, contrasts with the opportunities that sub-state governments have to shape EU policies within their member states. And it has been suggested that the Lisbon Treaty, by recognising a role for regional governments and regional parliaments in the operation of the subsidiarity principle, could have destabilised the relationships between its member states and their constituent territories by promoting regions within EU decision-making structures, likewise with the Committee of the Regions. But that's not my view, and there remain very limited opportunities for regional influence within the EU. The Committee of the Regions remains the weakest of the EU's institutions, and it's a far cry from the Europe of the Regions that once inspired Europe's stateless nations and regions. Now, if we think again of sovereignty claims as as expressing a desire for influence as well as a desire for self-government, then the EU's failure to provide a more meaningful role for sub-state governments in EU decision-making may be a contributory factor in secessionist demands. Whatever steps it takes or fails to take in recognising, in understanding, in forming, or mediating sovereignty disputes, the EU may one day have to confront the outcome of such a dispute. How it chooses to do so can be expected to be coloured by the constitutionality of the process, the strength of feeling demonstrated by citizens in the disputed territory and in the rest of the member state, and by a strategic calculation of its own interests. Continuing to remain detached from disputes it regards as internal matters for member states overlooks the blurring of the boundaries between the domestic and the European sphere that is the result of the integration process. Even were we to assume that these are wholly domestic affairs and that the EU has no business or authority to intervene, it could not avoid being affected by a prolonged sovereignty dispute within a member state. It may therefore be in the EU's interest to play some part in resolving it. Thank you very much. 